Hello, and welcome to Timing is Everything, a program of Care Dimensions, formerly Hospice of the North Shore in Greater Boston. My name is Mary Crow, Education Specialist at Care Dimensions. Today, our guest is Pat Ahern. She is the new CEO at Care Dimensions. Welcome to the show, Pat, and welcome to Care Dimensions. Thank you so much. It is a delight to be joining this organization and especially to be part of this amazing community. Oh, thank you. We're thrilled to have you here. So tell us a bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, I, uh, I have been blessed three times now in my career to be serving a large, distinguished, and wonderful hospice organization, first in Chicago, then in Buffalo, New York, and now comes the invitation to join Care Dimensions, which right. is a secondary delight because we also um, have our oldest child, our daughter, who lives here in Boston. So we get to we get to be in the same oh, community that's again. That's wonderful. So that's really been great. Oh, that's great. My history, uh, people usually want to know a little bit about how yep. I come by this work. I am 42 years a registered nurse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started nursing school when I was 12. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so um, I, I, I did almost all of my nursing career was in critical care and emergency trauma services. Wow. And then came the time in my career when I was responsible in the midst of the AIDS epidemic for mm -hmm. the HIV AIDS population in yeah. Chicago at a certain hospital that was really, really affected by the epidemic. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got to know about hospice oh, wow. because we needed a trusted partner in the community, someone that would help us take care of our patients. Wow. And that's when I that's when I got the bug. That's yeah. when I started to realize that hospice is really such a sensational and special um, privilege to serve. Yeah. Um, along the way, uh, from, while I was a nurse, I went back to school and I got my master's in business. So I have an MBA. So I always say I'm a registered nurse and an MBA, which makes me a little bit country and a little <laughs> bit rock and roll. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, and again, that was probably earlier on in, in really in the late when 80s, hospice, early 90s. Right. Yeah. So again, you know, hospice was very new and young yeah. then. That's exactly you know? right. So, you know, and hospice really sort of springs forth from the word hospitality. Yeah. And when you think about that, um, in many ways, that's what we do. We yeah. make sure that um, th that the people that we're serving and the people that uh, they love and care about are being uh, are having the best possible experience they can have, and how, that's that's a perfect definition of hospitality. Yeah, isn't it interesting how again it's you know you hear the H word mm -hmm. you know and and people really recoil and it's really sad for me because you're talking about a word that has a, a really a wonderful right. connotation right. to it and how those myths and misconceptions can really color yeah. that. Yeah, I have a girlfriend who always, who says that he, about families, it's always too soon and then it's too late. Yeah, isn't that true? Um, you know, we, all, we want to avoid, we wish that we didn't have to talk about these things. We wish, uh, we, you know, we, we, we hope for the best, but we don't really want to plan for the worst. Right. And so, um, and I would offer that hospice care is, is one of the best choices a family can make when the time remaining is so precious right. and you want better days. You yeah. want those days to be the best days possible. Absolutely. And you know, and we hear it time and time again, you know, <coughs> in terms of the people who have been really most resistant to it, when they finally come to, to really welcome and embrace hospice, they, they really wish that they had opened up sooner and welcomed them in in that That's way. That's absolutely so. For 22 years now as a yeah. hospice person, yeah. I have heard almost every day of my career um, regret, yeah. and especially on the part of families who yeah. say, why didn't I consider hospice sooner? Why didn't someone tell us? Why, why didn't we understand that time was short? And if yeah. we had understood that, we would have been so much more strategic yeah. about how we spent the time we had left. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a firm believer too. You know, you you hear sometimes medical personnel using the phrase, "There's nothing more we can yeah. do." I again, yeah. it breaks my heart because there's so much more yeah. we can do. So yeah. much more, so much more living. Yep. You know, in this stage of life, mm -hmm. and and I really, again, strongly believe yep. that this is what hospice does. I dream of a day when when every healthcare provider, instead of saying there's nothing more I can do, they say there's something more we can do. 
I want to introduce you to the people in hospice and palliative care because they're the ones that are going to help you stay home. They're the ones that are going to help you achieve the final things that almost universally everybody wants towards the end of their lives. Almost yeah. everyone wants to say, I love you, yeah. to one more person. Yes. Almost everyone wants to seek a little forgiveness from somebody. Yeah. And maybe a lot of us want to forgive someone else. Right. And finally, everyone wants to make sure that they are remembered. And so if you have the notice, yes. essentially, that time is short and precious, you're going you're gonna to fill your days with those kinds of activities. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And people really do want to be remembered. You they know? sure do. We, we need to know that our life had significance. And, and this yep. is a time to process that and to yep. work through all of that. I, we always tell the joke in my family that my grandmother's big secret was the final ingredient to the recipe <laughs> that she always kept back because she knew that that would keep us coming back for more. <laughs> Did she share and it? towards the end of her life, she finally shared the last oh, ingredient. Oh, isn't that something? And that happens all the time yeah. in families. What a gift. Mm -hmm. What a gift. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you were talking about, it when you were talking a little bit about your background and in terms of, you know, working with HIV and AIDS individuals, you know, and how that mm -hmm. certainly was a precipitant. But, you know, as we're talking about people who work for hospice, it's not a job. No. It, it's really a calling. Talk more about yeah. the, the what is it that fuels the passion? Yeah. In, in my opinion, the work that we do in hospice and palliative care is a ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean that in all the, in all the ways ministry is meant. Yes. Um, it is our calling and it is our great, great privilege to be welcomed in, to parachute in yeah. to the lives of a family at one of the most intimate and difficult times possible Absolutely. Um, and try to help them come through their experience in a different way. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways I think of hospice people kind of like midwives. Ah. So when you think about uh, you know when, when, a, when a young family is planning and expecting their children mm -hmm. they surround themselves with a whole lot of different you know special doctors, special yeah. supplies, yeah. they're reading different things, they're preparing for the arrival of, of, of their, their youngster. At the end of life, I think there's a need for another kind of midwifing. Absolutely, and that's yeah. what hospice and palliative care will do if you bring us in and you bring us sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Always remembering that regret is the single most frequent uh, remark that I hear still after yes. 22 years of running hospices. Yes. It's so important, I mean, again, that, you know, Sometimes, again, we, I mean, we've talked about this, but it's so important that people understand they hear that word hospice, and a lot of times people are just thinking that this yeah. is just for the very end. Right, it right. is so much more than that. Right. Talk, if you will, more about, uh, you know, really kind of the vision, you know, and, and the mission of hospice, if yeah. you will. Well, you know, hospice started as a model of neighbors helping neighbors. Yeah. And when you think about it, end-of-life care is all local and very intimate. Mm -hmm. And so while everyone bandies about national solutions for health care and health reform, the, 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 local, the local programs are going to be what we all really depend upon. And you, in a community like this, you need to be able to depend upon your hospice organization to, to, to supply you with the resources and the expertise and the space and time you need to, to really have a better ending. And that's what, that's what we're searching for. When yeah. you think about baby boomers, yes. 10,000 of us turn yeah. 65 yeah. every single day. Yes. We are all, the tsunami is moving towards Absolutely. end of life care. We're going to live a little longer yeah. than our grandparents did and our parents. Yes. But we're still we're still going to have an end of life experience, and we baby boomers want to have it our way. Absolutely. And so I think the future Absolutely. of this is um, being able to customize care, right? To be able to provide it um, the way that the patient and the family want it, not the way that we say it has to fit into the rules and regulations. Absolutely, so how different generationally, right? Mm -hmm. And again, the baby boomers, a very strong, right. strong generation, and it's different. They're mm -hmm. really, really very, right. uh, 
aware consumers right. you know very so it's a very different generation Definitely. here so I think that we're going to see yep. that differently aren't we baby boomers are going to do for end of life care what they did for beginning of life care there was no health care organization that was inviting the family to come in and witness the birth of the child or yep. who wants to cut the cord or yep. did you want lobster or, or yep. a steak for dinner okay. in the birthing room yep. that all came from consumer appetite that was baby boomers changing the beginning of life, the birthing experience. They are now g watching and witnessing their own parents, yep. um, some of them still yep. their grandparents, and they are they are setting their sights on having it my way. Yeah, I'm going to change yeah. it. And that's what I heard you saying. Is it's that again, people's voices are going to mm -hmm. be heard. Definitely. So it's more about understanding the individual. Mm -hmm. What is the person? Do they understand what's going on with them? What right. are the benefits? What are the burdens? What are their priorities? Right. And how do we align the mm -hmm. treatment goals with what their that's priorities right. are? And I don't think that's always done. Right. And how do we find them ways to achieve everything that they need to achieve at home? Yeah. Seventy percent of Americans say that when the time is come, they want to, to die in their own homes. Right. Yet. 70% of us right. are dying in hospitals and nursing homes. Yeah. We have a long way to we go. We sure do. <laughs> yeah, so again, voices aren't mm -hmm. being heard, but I agree with you, mm -hmm. the baby boomers, you know, they're a force to reckon with. That's exactly right. And that's right. a wonderful thing. Right. That's a wonderful and thing. And I, I always tell people, you know, folks ask me a lot about, you know, what kind of a physician do I need or what kind of health care provider should I be surrounding myself with? Again, baby boomers knowing that they have choices. Yes. And what I always say is make sure that you are being cared for by people that ask a different question. So the old question was, what's the matter with you? Yeah. And the new question is, what matters to Ooh, you? Yes. It's a very that's different very question different. and it flavors everything you do yes. for someone that's sick or concerned about how well they're how well they're gonna come through the wow. end of life experience. Wow, well said, yeah. That I, I wanna go back for a minute too. You had mentioned just in terms of you know, we you know, I, I think of Ira Bayok who I just admire so much and mm -hmm. he talks about you were talking about that social connection and that need for community. Mm -hmm. And we are social beings. That's right. You know, and, and he you know, he really kind of made reference to that, you know, really that connection, you know, yeah. is that ground substance of therapeutics. Right. We have to feel that connection. How isolating is medical care That's right exactly now. Right. So well, just and, and I am that. I'm willing to offer to people that if, if you just change a little bit about your thinking, mm -hmm. instead of thinking of end of life and dying as a medical event, think about it as a life event. Right. And that really changes your point of view. Sure does. Um, because for other life events, you're preparing, you're planning, you're getting, you know, you're, you're, you're making sure that the details are tended to. If it's a life event, mm -hmm. you, are, you are not so much a victim of what's wrong with you. Yes. You are in control of yeah. what's wrong with you yeah. for as long as you live. Absolutely. Um, and so choosing to at least make an inquiry choosing early on when you're seriously ill. Let me let me find out about these hospice programs in the community. Yeah. Let me do my shopping, if yeah. you will, yes. and let me do my discerning about what does matter most to me. Mm -hmm. Do it early before yeah. you're too sick to really think through your choices. Right. Yeah. Um, and baby boomers are planners, so yes, I have yeah. some confidence in that. Yeah, because, and you're right, these things, you know, it really is a cognitive reframing, mm -hmm, isn't mm -hmm. it? Just like yeah. you said, and I think, again, we, we have to empower people <coughs> to do that. That's exactly Certainly right. Certainly those baby boomers will do that. So talk a little bit more, too, if you will, about uh, there's just so many obstacles. Why still? Yeah. Why still yeah. do we hit all these roadblocks? You know, I, and I think it's, it's a great big long equation. It's a whole lot of things. Um, part of it has to do with you know with with the way health care is paid for in America yep. and so um, we, we don't do enough to help physicians and providers mm -hmm. um, it, stay whole for themselves yeah. while they're coaching their patients and their families in different directions yes um, and so for sure the health care reimbursement system gets in our way but mostly I think it's an American persona. Mm -hmm. I, I have a friend who is an Italian physician who says that the Americans are the only ones that think they've got a choice about whether or not they'll <laughs> die. <laughs> we do have this aversion mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that that is just something that has been difficult for all of us to overcome. Yeah. Um, 
and and we have to if we, right. if we want to have the experience that the people that we know and love deserve we're going to have to talk openly and more honestly about end of life right. um, just like we talk about it at the beginning absolutely to make hospice and palliative care as part of the continuum of care as opposed to a last resort. Absolutely. My dream is, um, and I will retire once this happens, that hospice is no longer the last resort, but instead let it be the final reward. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't that be yes, something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I still, you know, and, and talk, talk to me about this, if you will. You know, there's still that pressure, I think, on physicians. Yeah. You know, we're... Mm -hmm. Death seems as the final That's failure, right? Mm -hmm. right? And I think so. Yeah. Th there's still that, and we, yeah. we assume that all physicians right. kind of have a handle on this, know how to have these right. conversations. Right. This is difficult. And we paint these doctors into a corner, and we often also forget that they have so much history with their patients mm -hmm. by the time the end of lifetime is coming. They're, they, they're almost like family for lots and lots of patients. Yeah. And so no wonder there's a difficulty sure. and a reluctance to sort of out the reality. Mm -hmm. They also have a duty and they know it, but it's very, very difficult and yeah. we don't train them yeah. adequately at all yeah. about how to have these difficult conversations. It's yeah. not just physicians, no. it's also nurses, right. social workers, yes. all the important yeah. people in your life, pharmacists. Think about the kinds of people that yeah. you trust that you would like to be able to sort of give you some scoops and, and clues and tips about what's coming next. Yeah. And so we have to give those these these professional people permission to be honest. Absolutely. And um, and, and we don't always. We right. have incredible expectations of them that they can they they don't have much of a shot at meeting. Right. Well, I think part of that you know it, it comes from part, partially our training, mm -hmm. part of out who we are as human beings yep. that we come to this and we want to fix things. Right. And right. and how to reconcile right. that right. we can't fix everything. Right. That's you know, exactly right. and it, it, that I think it's really hard to kind of come to terms with that, but that it doesn't mean that it's there's not something wonderful that we can do in that process. Right, right, right. And so you know, making sure that there is an ending that is memorable, mm. uh, the memories that you make are yeah. incredible, um, and and families you can see them glow. You know, I, I'll 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 be in line at the at the post office or at the grocery store. I'll still have my little name tag on. And the families come up to me and yes. they tell me about their experiences. Absolutely. So when they've had a hospice experience in a family, it's much more likely that they will consider a second hospice experience earlier. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and people do remember it, don't they, Pat? It's, oh, yeah. it's just, it, it, this is so significant. This affects one's bereavement. Right. right. This has to be done well. We get right. one chance at we this. We have one shot to get yep. it right. Yep. And like I say, it, since it's a life event, it only this life event only happens once, yeah. uh, like the other one we all share. Yeah, um, yeah. And, it, and it, we have the chance to make memories that are more forgiving and, and, and more lively. Um, if we handle our end of life care experience as well. And you need a little, most people need a little help with that. They, they need a little help to make sure that they're getting the medicine at the right doses. Yeah. Most people don't want to be medicated so that they're not aware. Right. Most people just want, you know, they want the edge taken off of their pain so that they're, so that they can, so that they can make it through their days right. and have coherent conversations. Yes. And we are the experts in this. Right. We are the ones that can help you with the shortness of breath and, you know, all the kinds of symptoms that come along with serious burdensome illness. We'll be able to help with those things so that you can focus on you right. and the people you love. Absolutely. So again, helping people again to get over those myths and misconceptions mm -hmm. that hospice is far from giving up hope. Yep. It, it's really about redefining right. it. We take care of patients. There are some patients in almost all hospice programs that are still are still with us a year after we've admitted sure. them. Yeah. By far and away, our bigger problem is that the patients get referred too late. So 50% of our patients die within the first two weeks wow. of admission. Yeah. And so that's way too soon. We can't help enough. We can help, but we can't help enough. Right. Yeah. And so, um, but but there. The, the only rules for Medicare beneficiaries for hospice care yep. is that um, if the disease runs its usual expected course, yep. 
that um, the patient is within the last six months of their life. Does that mean that we have to kick them out when <laughs> six months is over? Absolutely not. Right. We just have to justify to Medicare yeah. that, um, and to their insurance companies that they still have a terminal illness yeah. and um, what we're doing for them. Yeah. There are some hospice patients that get better during yeah. our care. We call those graduations. Yeah. Um, and sometimes uh, you know, the, the amount of care, the nurses in the home several times a week, the medicines, mm -hmm. the oxygen, the, uh, the overbed table in a hospital bed, all those things actually conspire to help the patient feel better and get yeah, better. Yes. And then we do have to discharge the patient yep. um, to, to regular um, care for yep. their, from their providers. Sure. And we know that they have serious illness and chances are we'll see them again. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And again, it, you know, that's the piece again that people think that again, it means taking to the bed right. and, and waiting for a medical event to occur. Right. Far right. from it. It really is. I have had hospice patients that uh, went on a last trip on a gambling boat. <laughs> <laughs> I've had hospice patients that went on a final date, yeah. went to went to see uh, an art exhibit. You know, we can we can rally round them. And I had a hospice patient in Chicago who had been an Olympian swimmer. Oh, wow. And her goal was to swim a few more times. Wow. And sure enough, didn't we work with one of our hospitals that had a, a therapy pool? Yeah. And the nurse, the hospice nurse, went swimming with the yeah. patient. Yeah. And so we can we can figure out how to how to help yeah. you get a lot of stuff done if we know you a little sooner. Right. Well, that's what I love is that thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. You know. So again, we we kind of have this vision of kind of the that typical or you know standardized medicine. And, and it's really more than that. Yeah, yeah. It's really, I, I loved when they, you know, I, this, this sentence about, well, you know, when you're on hospice, you're not a patient, you're a human being. That's exactly right. It, it really is whole person care. Yeah. Um, and the, the secret sauce of hospice and palliative care is the plans are not just for the patient. Mm -hmm. They're not just for the person who's sick. They are for the family and the people yeah. that they love. After the patient has died, there will be support and services for those families and loved ones for as long as they need them. And so helping them deal with their times of bereavement, helping them deal with that year of firsts, you right. know, the first Father's right. Day, the first sure. birthday, first anniversary. The hospice people will be there to help families navigate all mm -hmm. of that change while they all try to find whatever their new normal is. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not just about the person who's sick, it's about everything that they care about. Yeah, which is, it's just a wonderful and a unique part of hospice. Mm -hmm. They understand it's the whole system, yep. you know, and, and that family means anyone who loves and supports you. That's it's exactly not a blood right. relation. That's exactly that's right. Great. Other obstacles that you can think of that, what is it that gets in the way? Other things can you think of? I think reluctance and, and you know, the, this, uh, there are things about our language that cause us yeah. to, to, to uh, feel awkward. You know, you hear people say she fought the good fight or she's yeah. losing her yes. battle to cancer or, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of words get in the way of developmental thinking. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that, and again, that's pretty American. Yes, um, very much and, so. And so when we, when, we, when we say things like that or we talk about the fact that we're on some kind of a battleground, that right. makes the, the, ultimate, the ultimate death and dying time the loss. Right. And we're all going to do that. Right. I mean, it's not a loss. Yes. Hopefully, it's the completion of a life carefully and wonderfully led. Right. Um, and we should be honoring that life rather than talking about the fact that we lost the war. Yeah, you know, I think, again, words are so sharp. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that sometimes we're not even aware of the impact that yep. they have. Mm -hmm. And again, from both perspectives. Right. So from the patient perspective mm -hmm. of that, whether did I fight hard enough, yeah. feeling like a failure in a yeah. sense, right? If they yeah. didn't do that, even if they feel ready for that time. That's exactly right. And from the family perspective, feeling like, did I do enough? Did I do enough? That's it's, exactly it's, right. What a, it's complex. That's exactly right. And I think the other thing that is difficult for families is if they haven't talked about what matters most to them, Yeah. Um, then the, the, you know, and then there's a sudden something, you know, dad yes. has a stroke. Yep. And then you're in the, because I, I was, I was this nurse in the emergency department and you'd look at the family and you'd say, well, we could, we could go with, a, we could put a respirator in, we maybe in pacemaker, we, we need yep. to start doing these things. Yeah. 
is that what you think your your dad would have wanted? And yeah. you look at the siblings, and they all and they say, we never talked about it. Oof. We would never talk about it. Wow. And so, in a way, I I encourage families also to to forget to pre forgive the yeah. people that are going to make choices for them. Yes. You know, I have said to my children, whatever choices you make, once you know my values, I forgive you. Right. You'll yes. uh, you'll do what you think is best. Yep. And that's what that that's what I'm why I'm trusting you. Yes. That's why you should be very careful to make sure that you choose someone that um, understands you and your intentions to be your voice when you cannot speak for yourself. Absolutely. So uh, um, appointing someone to be your durable proxy, uh, you know, for, for health care is extremely important. Absolutely. Someone that will speak with your voice. We, absolutely, and we've talked about this. It's so essential, and we can't talk about this topic enough no. because still, still a very yep. small portion of society has completed very these small. forms. Right. You know, and the other piece to that, and I love how you say that in terms of pre-forgive, if you have these discussions, Again, it's very hard to make life or death decisions on an, on behalf of someone right. we love. If That's we right. had these conversations, we're following through right. on wishes as opposed right. to making life or death decisions. Right. Still doesn't listen. Right. It's still hard, right? Right. But it's different right. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And then then forgive That's for everything exactly left right. over because exactly we certainly right. can't cover every single angle. We, That's right. You know? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's why you have to know someone's heart and someone's intentions yeah, because yeah. you will never be able to predict the actual scenario. Right, exactly. Uh, you won't get it right. Um, yeah. As much as we wish that we could, yeah. we won't. It's in the end not in our hands. Yes, yes. Um, and so I think that th that's extremely important. Uh, I, I think it's also important to think about natural times when families can orchestrate a conversation that maybe people don't want to have. Yep. When you think about it, you know, uncle so-and-so died this week right. and so we're at the breakfast after the after the funeral or yeah. the lunch after the funeral yeah. that would be a natural time for someone to say you know what would you have wanted yes if you were as sick as him what yeah. how would you have wanted that yeah. there are natural times right. um, when a spouse dies yes. and then it's a natural time to talk to the one that remains sure you know how did this go for us yeah. and what would you have changed yeah. for yourself yes um, uh, believe it or not the holidays, you know, when yes. the family is yeah. together, yeah. Um, it can be a great time to just have a quiet little conversation right. about, you know, if this were to happen to me, here's what I would want and here's what I wouldn't want. Yep, absolutely. And, and to make it more natural, like you say, as opposed to waiting yeah. for crisis time right. when it's the worst time you can be right. doing things. Right. So we have a just about a, a couple minutes left. So what? give a message. Message to patients and families. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? You know, we we are taking care of right now of course we're taking care of our greatest generation mm -hmm. and we want to honor them and we want to make sure that the lives that they're completing are as distinguished as the lives that they led that's what families and friends and loved ones are for step up don't have any regrets right. loss is one thing but regrets are an entirely another oh absolutely absolutely so again we we have a, about 15 seconds left so just any last last thing you want to say to the audience i want to make sure that this audience knows that the danvers community in particular has been extremely welcoming and um, when you're moving in it's it's a delight uh, to be with and among people that are that are eager for for you and very very eager for the success of Care Dimensions. Well, thank you. It's it's a pleasure to have you with thank us. You. And thank you so much for taking the time and being Absolutely. on the show today. Love it. Thank you. So again, thank you for tuning in. And uh, to, to timing is everything. And we look forward to you being a part of the next show. Care Dimensions, formerly Hospice of the North Shore in Greater Boston, is different in that we do more than just hospice. It's just incredible the services they provide when people need it the most. So being able to offer more individualized care helps people feel more cared for. Because it's about the patient's quality of life. I don't think there's any place else in the Boston area like Care Dimensions. At Care Dimensions, we'll take care of your family like you're a part of ours. Visit us at caredimensions.org.